Dramatis Personae of the Comedy of Errors by William Shakespeare Translated by William George Clarke This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dramatis Personae Saulinas, Duke of Ephesus Read by Francis Brown Aegean, a merchant of Syracuse Read by Bob Neufeld. Antipholus of Ephesus. Read by Todd. Antipholus of Syracuse. Read by Glorious Job. Twin brothers and sons to Aegean and Amelia. Dromio of Ephesus. Read by Dustin Tuttle. Dromio of Syracuse. Read by Krzysztofinski. Twin brothers and attendants on the two Antipholuses. Balthasar, a merchant. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. Angelo, a goldsmith. Read by Jason Mills. First merchant, friend to Antipholus of Syracuse. Read by Chris Cartwright. Second merchant, to whom Angelo is a debtor. Read by Chris Cartwright. Pinch, a schoolmaster. Read by Hallie Kill. Amelia, wife to Aegean, an abbess at Ephesus. Read by Libby Gone. Adriana, wife to Antipholus of Ephesus. Read by Wally B. Luciana, her sister. Read by Amanda Friday. Luce, servant to Adriana. Read by Charlotte Duckett. A courtesan. Read by Marion Carwin. Gaula, officers, and other attendants. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. And Wally B. Narrated by Christine G. Of the Comedy of Errors by William Shakespeare. Translated by William George Clark. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act 1. Scene 1. A hall in the duke's palace. Enter duke, Aegeon, Gaolus, officers, and other attendants. Proceed, Solinus, to procure my fall, and by the doom of death and woes and all. Merchant of Syracuse, plea no more. I am not partial to infringe our laws. The enmity and discord which of late sprung from the rancorous outrage of your duke to merchants our well-dealing countrymen who wanting guilders to redeem their lives have sealed his rigorous statutes with their bloods excludes all pity from our threatening looks for since the mortal and intestine jars twixt thy seditious countrymen and us in half in solemn synods been decreed both by syracusians and ourselves to admit no traffic to our adverse towns. Nay, more, if any born at Ephesus be seen, at any Syracusian marts and fairs, again, if any Syracusian born come to the bay of Ephesus, he dies. His goods confiscate to the duke's dispose, unless a thousand marks be levied to quit the penalty and to ransom him. Thy substance, valued at the highest rate, cannot amount unto a hundred marks, Therefore, by law, thou art condemned to die. Yet this my comfort, when your words are done, my woes end likewise with the evening sun. Well, Syracusian, say in brief the cause, why thou departed from thy native home, and for what cause thou camest to Ephesus. A heavier task could not have been imposed than I to speak my griefs unspeakable. Yet, that the world may witness that my end was wrought by nature, not by vile offence, I'll utter what my sorrow gives me leave. In Syracusa was I born, and wed unto a woman, happy but for me, and by me had not our hap been bad. With her I lived in joy. Our wealth increased by prosperous voyages I often made to Epidamnum, 
till my factor's death and the great care of goods at random left drew me from kind embracements of my spouse from whom my absence was not six months old before herself almost at fainting under the pleasing punishment that women bear had made provision for her following me and soon and safe arrived where i was there she had not been long but she became a joyful mother of two goodly sons and which was strange the one so like the other as could not be distinguished but by names that very hour and in the self-same inn a meaner woman was delivered of such a burden male twins both alike those for their parents were exceeding poor, I bought and brought up to attend my sons. My wife, not meanly proud of two such boys, made daily motions for our home return. Unwilling, I agreed. Alas, too soon we came aboard. A league from Epidamnum had we sailed before the always wind-obeying deep gave any tragic instance of our harm. But longer did we not retain much hope, for what obscured light the heavens did grant did but convey unto our fearful minds a doubtful warrant of immediate death, which, though myself would gladly have embraced, yet the incessant weepings of my wife, weeping before for what she saw must come, and piteous plainings of the pretty babes, that mourned for fashion, ignorant what to fear, forced me to seek delays for them and me. And this it was, for other means was none, the sailors sought for safety by our boat, and left the ship, then sinking ripe to us. My wife, more careful for the latter born, had fastened him unto a small spare mast, such as seafaring men provide for storms. To him one of the other twins was bound, whilst I had been like heedful of the other. The children thus disposed, my wife and I, fixing our eyes on whom our care was fixed, fastened ourselves at either end the mast and floating straight obedient to the stream was carried towards corinth as we thought at length the sun gazing upon the earth dispersed those vapours that offended us and by the benefit of this wished light the seas waxed calm and we discovered two ships from far making a main to us of corinth that of epidaurus this but ere they came oh let me say no more gather the sequel by that went before nay forward old man do not break off so for we may pity though not pardon thee oh had the gods done so i had not now worthily termed them merciless to us for ere the ships could meet by twice five leagues we were encountered by a mighty rock which being violently borne upon our helpful ship was splitted in the midst so that in this unjust divorce of us fortune had left to both of us alike what to delight in what to sorrow for her part poor soul seeming as burdened with lesser weight but not with lesser woe was carried with more speed before the wind and in our sight they three were taken up by fishermen of Corinth, as we thought. At length another ship had seized on us, and knowing who it was their hap to save, gave healthful welcome to their shipwrecked guests, and would have reft the fishers of their prey, had not their bark been very slow of sail, and therefore homeward did they bend their course thus have you heard me severed from my bliss that by misfortunes was my life prolonged to tell sad stories of my own mishaps and for the sake of them thou sorrowest for do me the favour to dilate it full what hath befallen on them and thee till now my youngest boy and yet my eldest care at eighteen years became inquisitive after his brother and importuned me that his attendant, 
so his case was like, reft of his brother but retained his name, might bear him company in the quest of him. Whom, whilst I laboured of a love to see, I hazarded the loss of whom I loved. Five summers have I spent in furthest Greece, roaming clean through the bounds of Asia, and coasting homeward, came to Ephesus. Hopeless to find, yet loath to leave unsought, or that or any place that harbors men. But here must end the story of my life, and happy were I in my timely death, could all my travels warrant me they live. Hapless Aegean, whom the fates have marked to bear the extremity of dire mishap, now trust me were it not against our laws, against my crown, my oath, my dignity, which princes would they made not disunnel, my soul should sue as advocate for thee. But thou, thou, but though thou art a judge to the death, and passed sentence may not be recalled. But to our honour's great disparagement, Yet I will favour thee in what I can. Therefore, merchant, I'll limit thee this day to seek thy help by beneficial help. Try all the friends thou hast in Ephesus, beg thou, or borrow to make up the sum. And live, if no, then thou art doomed to die. Galar, take him to thy custody. I will, my lord. Hopeless and helpless doth Aegean wend but to procrastinate his lifeless end. Exeunt Scene 2. The Mart Enter Antipholus of Syracuse, Dromio of Syracuse, and First Merchant. Therefore give out your of Epidamnon, lest that your goods too soon be confiscate. This very day a Syracusian merchant is apprehended for arrival here, and not being able to buy out his life, according to the statute of the town, dies ere the weary sun set in the west. There is your money that I had to keep. Go bear it to the centaur where we host, and stay there, Dromeo, till I come to thee. Within this hour it will be dinner time. Till that, I'll view the manners of the town, peruse the traders, gaze upon the buildings, and then return, and sleep within mine inn, for with long travel I am stiff and weary. Get thee away. Many a man would take you at your word, and go indeed, having so good a mean. Exit. A trusty villain, sir, that very oft, when I am dull with care and melancholy, lightens my humour with his merry jests. What, will you walk with me about the town, and then go to my inn and dine with me? I am invited, sir, to certain merchants of whom I hope to make much benefit. I crave your pardon. Soon, at five o'clock, please you. I'll meet with you upon the mart, and afterward consort you till bedtime. My present business calls me from you now. Farewell till then. I will go lose myself, and wander up and down to view the city. Sir, I commend you to your own content. Exit. He that commends me to mine own content commends me to the thing I cannot get. I to the world am like a drop of water, that in the ocean seeks another drop who, falling there to find his fellow forth, unseen, inquisitive, confounds himself, so I, to find a mother and a brother, in quest of them, unhappy, lose myself. Enter Dromio of Ephesus. Here comes the almanac of my true date. What now? How chance thou art returned so soon? Returned so soon? Rather approach too late. The capon burns, the pig falls from the spit, the clock hath struck in twelve upon the bell. My mistress made it one upon my cheek. She is so hot because the meat is cold. The meat is cold because you come not home. You come not home because you have no stomach. You have no stomach, having broken your fast. But we that know what tis to fast and pray are penitent for your default today. Stop in your wind, sir. Tell me this, I pray. Where have you left the money that I gave you? Oh, sixpence that I had a Wednesday last to pay the saddler for my mistress's crupper? The saddler had it, sir. I kept it not. I am not in a sport of humour now. Tell me and dally not, where is the money? We being strangers here, how darest thou trust so great a charge from thine own custody? I pray you jest, sir, as you sit at dinner. I for my mistress come to you in post. If I return, I shall be post indeed, for she will score your fault upon my pate. 
methinks your maul like mine should be your clock and strike you home without a messenger come dromeo come these jests are out of season reserve them till a merrier hour than this where is the gold i gave in charge to thee to me sir why you gave no gold to me come on sir knave have done your foolishness and tell me how thou hast disposed thy charge my charge was but to fetch you from the mart home to your house the phoenix sir to dinner my mistress and her sister stays for you now as i am a christian answer me in what safe place you have bestowed my money or i shall break that merry sconce of yours that stands on tricks when i am undisposed where is the thousand marks thou hadst of me i have some marks of yours upon my pate some of my mistress's marks upon my shoulders but not a thousand marks between you both if i should pay your worship those again perchance you will not bear them patiently thy mistress marks what mistress slave hast thou your worship's wife my mistress at the phoenix she that doth fast till you come home to dinner and prays that you will hie you home to dinner what wilt thou flout me thus unto my face being forbid there take you that sir knave what mean you sir for god's sake hold your hands nay and you will not sir i'll take my heels exit upon my life by some device or other the villain is o'er out of all my money they say this town is full of cousinage as nimble jugglers that deceive the eye dark working sorcerers that change the mind soul killing witches that deform the body disguised cheaters prating mountebanks and many such liberties of sin if it proves so i will be gone the sooner i'll to the centaur to go seek the slave i greatly fear my money is not safe exit end of act one Two of the Comedy of Errors by William Shakespeare, translated by William George Clark. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two. Scene One: The House of Antipholus of Ephesus. Enter Adriana and Luciana. Neither my husband nor the slave returned, that in such haste I sent to seek his master. Sure, Luciana, it is two o'clock. Perhaps some merchant hath invited him, and from the mart he somewhere gone to dinner. Good sister, let us dine, and never fret. A man is master of his liberty. Time is their master, and when they see time, they'll go or come. If so, be patient, sister why should their liberty than ours be more because their business still lies out o door look when i serve him so he takes it ill oh no he is the brindle of your will there's none but asses will be bridled so why headstrong liberty is lashed with woe there's nothing situate under heaven's eye but hath his bound in earth in sea in sky the beast the fishes and the winged fowls are their male subjects and at their controls men more divine the masters of all these lords of the wide world and wild watery seas endued with intellectual sense and souls of more preeminence than fish and fowls are masters to their females and their lords then let your will attend on their accords this servitude makes you to keep unwed not this but troubles of the marriage bed but were you wedded you would bear some sway ere i learn love i'll practise to obey how if your husband start some other where till he come home again i would forbear patience unmoved no marvel through she pause they can be meek that have no other cause a wretched soul bruised with adversity we bid be quiet when we hear it cry but were we burdened with like weight of pain as much or more we should ourselves complain so thou that hast no unkind mate to grieve thee with urging helpless patience wouldst relieve me 
but if thou live to see like right benefit this fool begged patience in thee will be left well i will marry one day but to try here comes your man now is your husband nigh enter dromio of ephesus say is your tardy master now at hand nay he's at two hands with me and that my two ears can witness say didst thou speak with him knowest thou his mind ay ay he told his mind upon mine ear but through his hand i scarce could understand it spake he so doubtfully thou couldst not feel his meaning nay he struck so plainly i could too well feel his blows and withal so doubtfully that i could scarce understand them but say i pray thee is he coming home it seems he hath great care to please his wife why mistress sure my master is horn mad horn mad thou villain i mean not cuckold mad but sure he is stark mad when I desired him to come home to dinner, he asked me for a thousand marks in gold. "'Tis dinner-time,' quoth I. "'My gold,' quoth he. "'Your meat doth burn,' quoth I. "'My gold,' quoth he. "'Will you come home?' quoth I. "'My gold,' quoth he. "'Where is the thousand marks I gave thee, villain?' "'The pig,' quoth I, "'is burned. "'My gold,' quoth he. "'My mistress, sir,' quoth I. "'Hang up thy mistress. "'I know not thy mistress. "'Out on thy mistress.' "'Quoth who?' Quoth my master, I know, quoth he, no house, no wife, no mistress. So that my errand do unto my tongue, I thank him, I bear home upon my shoulders, for in conclusion he did beat me there. Go back again, thou slave, and fetch him home. Go back again, and be new beaten home? For God's sake, send some other messenger. Back, slave, or I will break thy pate across. And he will bless that cross with another beating. Between you I shall have a holy head. Hence, prating peasant, fetch thy master home. Am I so round with you as you with me, that like a football you do spurn me thus? You spurn me hence, and he will spurn me hither. If I last in this service, you must case me in leather. By how impatience lowereth in your face! His company must do his minions grace. Whilst I at home start for a merry look hath homely age the alluring beauty took from my poor cheek then he hath wasted it are my discourses dull barren my wit if valuable and sharp discourse be marred unkindness blunts it more than marble hard do their gay vestments his affections bait that's not my fault he's master of my state what ruins are in me that can be found by him not ruined then is he the ground of my defeatures my decayed fair a sunny look of his world soon repair but to unruly dear he breaks the pale and feeds from home for i am but his stale self-harming jealousy by beat it hence unfeeling fools can with such wrongs dispense I know his eye doth homage otherwhere, or else what lets it but he would be here? Sister, you know he promised me a chain. Would that alone, alone he would detain, so he would keep fair quarter with his bed. I see the jewel best enameled, will lose his beauty, yet the gold bides still. That others touch and often touching will, wear gold, and no man that hath a name, by falsehood and corruption doth it shame since that my beauty cannot please his eye i'll weep what's left away and weeping die how many fond fools serve mad jealousy exeunt scene two a public place enter antipholus of syracuse the gold i gave to dromio is laid up safe at the centaur and the heedful slave is wandered forth in care to seek me out by computation in mine host's report. I could not speak with Dromio since at first I sent him from the mart. See, here he comes. Enter Dromio of Syracuse. How now, sir? Is your merry humor altered? As you love jokes, so jest with me again. You know no centaur, you received no gold. 
Your mistress sent to have me home to dinner? My house was at the Phoenix? Wast thou mad, that thus so madly thou didst answer me? What answer, sir? When spake I such a word? Even now, even here, not half an hour since. I did not see you since you sent me hence, home to the centaur with the gold you gave me. Villain, thou didst deny the gold's receipt, and toldest me of a mistress and a dinner, for which I hope thou feltest I was displeased. I am glad to see you in this merry vein. What means this jest? I pray you, master, tell me. Yea, dost thou jeer and flout with me in the teeth? Thinkest thou I jest? Hold, take thou that, and that. Beating him. Hold, sir, for God's sake, now your jest is earnest. Upon what bargain do you give it me? Because that I familiarly sometimes do use you for my fool, and chat with you, your sauciness will jest upon my love, and make a common of my serious hours. When the sun shines, let foolish gnats make sport, but creep in crannies when he hides his beams. If you will jest with me, know my aspect, and fashion your demeanor to my looks, or I will beat this method in your sconce. Sconce, you call it? So you would leave battering, I had rather have it ahead, and you use these blows long I must get a sconce for my head, and insconce it too, or else I shall seek my wit in my shoulders. But I pray, sir, why am I beaten? Dost thou not know? Nothing, sir, but that I am beaten. Shall I tell you why? Ay, sir, and wherefore? For they say every why hath a wherefore. Why, first for flouting me, and then wherefore, for urging it the second time to me. Was there ever any man thus beaten out of season, when in the why and the wherefore is neither rhyme nor reason? Well, sir, I thank you. Thank me, sir, for what? Marry, sir, for this something that you gave me for nothing. I'll make you amends next to give you nothing for something. But say, sir, is it dinner time? No, sir, I think the meat wants that I have. In good time, sir, what's that? Fasting. Well, sir, then twill be dry. If it be, sir, I pray you eat none of it. Your reason? Lest it make you choleric and purchase me another dry basting. Well, sir, learn to jest in good time. There's a time for all things. I durst have denied that, before you were so choleric. By what rule, sir? Marry, sir, by a rule as plain as the plain bold pate of Father Time himself. Let's hear it. There's no time for a man to recover his hair that grows bold by nature. May he not do it by fine and recovery? Yes, to pay a fine for a periwig and recover the lost hair of another man. Why is time such a niggard of hair, being, as it is, so plentiful in excrement? Because it is a blessing that he bestows on beasts, and what he hath scanted men in hair he hath given them in wit. Why, but there is many a man hath more hair than wit. Not a man of those, but he hath the wit to lose his hair. Why, thou didst conclude hairy men plain dealers without wit. The plainer dealer the sooner lost, yet he loseth it in a kind of jollity. For what reason? For two, and sound ones, too. Nay, not sound, I pray you. Sure ones, then. Nay, not sure, in a thing falsing. Certain ones, then. Name them. The one, to save the money that he spends in trimming, the other, that at dinner they should not drop in his porridge. You would all this time have proved there is no time for all things. Marry and did, sir, namely no time to recover hair lost by nature. But your reason was not substantial. Why, there is no time to recover. Thus I mended. Time himself is bold, and therefore to the world's end will have bold followers. I knew it would be a bald conclusion, but soft, who wafts us yonder? Enter Adriana and Luciana. Ay, ay, Antipholus, look strange and frown. Some other mistress hath thy sweet aspects. I am not Adriana, nor thy wife. The time was once when thou unurged wouldest vow that never words were music to thine ear, that never object pleasing in thine eye, that never touch well welcome to thy hand, that never meat sweet savoured in thy taste, unless I spake or looked or touched 
or carved to thee how comes it now my husband oh how comes it that thou art then estranged from thyself thyself i call it being strange to me that undividable incorporate am better than thy dear self's better part ah do not tear away thyself from me for know my love as easy mayest thou fall a drop of water in the breaking gulf and take unmingled thence that drop again without addition or diminishing as take from me thyself and not me too how dearly would it touch thee to the quick shouldst thou but hear i were licentious and that this body consecrate to thee by ruffian lust should be contaminate wouldst thou not spit at me and spurn at me and hurl the name of husband in my face and tear the stained skin off my harlot brow and from my false hand cut the wedding ring and break it with a deep divorcing vow i know thou canest and therefore see thou do it i am possessed with an adulterate blot my blood is mingled with the crime of lust if we two be one and thou play false i do digest the poison of thy flesh being strumpeted by thy contagion keep then fair league and truce with thy true bed i live disdained thou undishonoured plead you to me fair dame i know you not in ephesus i am but two hours old as strange unto your town as to your talk who every word by all my wit being scanned wants wit in one word to understand fie brother how the world is changed with you when were you wont to use my sister thus she sent for you by dromio home to dinner by dromio by me by thee and this thou didst return from him that he did buffet thee and in his blows denied my house for his me for his wife did you converse sir with this gentlewoman what is the course and drift of your compact i sir i never saw her till this time villain thou liest for even her very words didst thou deliver to me on the mart. I never spake with her in all my life. How can she thus, then, call us by our names, unless it be by inspiration? How ill agrees it with your gravity, to counterfeit thus grossly with your slave, abetting him to thwart me in my mood. Be it my wrong, you are from me exempt, but wrong not wrong with a more contempt. Come, I will fasten on this sleeve of thine. Thou art an elm, my husband, I of thine, whose weakness, married to thy stronger state, makes me with thy strength to communicate. If aught possess thee from me, it is dross, usurping ivy, briar, or idle moss, who, all for want of pruning, with intrusion, infect thy sap and live on thy confusion. To me she speaks. She moves me for her theme. What? Was I married to her in my dream? Or sleep I now, and think I hear all this? What error drives our eyes and ears amiss? Until I know this sure uncertainty, I'll entertain the offered fallacy. Dromeo, go bid the servant spread for dinner. Oh, for my beads, I cross me for a sinner. This is the fairy land, O oh, spite of spites. We talk with goblins, owls, and sprites. If we obey them not, this will ensue. They'll suck our breath, or pinch as black and blue. Why prattest thou to thyself, and answerest not? Dromeo, thou drone, thou snail, thou slug, thou sot. I am transformed, master, am I not? I think thou art in mind, and so am I. Nay, master, both in mind and in my shape. Thou hast thine own form? No, I am an ape. If thou art changed to aught, tis to an ass. Tis true, she rides me, and I long for grass. Tis so, I'm an ass, else it could never be, but I should know her as well as she knows me. Come, come, no longer will I be a fool, to put the finger in the eye and weep. Whilst man and master laughs, my woes to scorn. Come, sir, to dinner. Tromeo, keep the gate. Husband, I'll dine above with you to-day, and shrive you of a thousand idle pranks. Sirrah, if any ask you for your master, say he dines forth, and let no creature enter. Come, sister, Tromeo, play the porter well. Am I in earth, in heaven, or in hell? 
sleeping or waking, mad or well advised, known unto these and to myself disguised? I'll say as they say, and persevere so, and in this midst that all adventures go. Master, shall I be porter at the gate? Aye, and let none enter, lest I break your pate. Come, come, Antipholus, we dine too late. Exeunt. End of Act Two. Three of the Comedy of Errors by William Shakespeare, translated by William George Clarke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene one, before the house of Antipholus of Ephesus. Enter Antipholus of Ephesus, Dromio of Ephesus, Angelo and Balthasar. Good Signor Angelo, you must excuse us all. My wife is shrewish when I keep not ours. Say that I lingered with you at your shop to see the making of her carcanet, and that tomorrow you will bring it home. But here's a villain that would face me down. He met me on the mart, and that I beat him and charged him with a thousand marks in gold and that I did deny my wife and house. Thou drunkard thou, what didst thou mean by this? Say what you will, sir, but I know what I know, that you beat me at the mart, I have your hand to show. If the skin were parchment and the blows you gave were ink, your own handwriting would tell you what I think. I think thou art an ass. Mary, so it doth appear, by the wrongs I suffer and the blows I bear, I should kick, being kicked, and being at that pass, you would keep from my heels and beware of an ass. You're sad, Signor Balthazar. Pray God our cheer may answer my good will, and your good welcome here. I hold your dainties cheap, sir, and your welcome dear. Oh, Signor Balthazar, either at flesh or fish, a table full of welcome makes scarce one dainty dish. Good meat, sir, is common. That every churl affords. And welcome more common, for that's nothing but words. Small cheer and great welcome makes a merry feast. I to a niggardly host and a more sparing guest. But though my cates be mean, take them in good part. Better cheer may you have, but not with better heart. But soft, my door is locked. Go bid them let us in. Maud, Bridget, Marion, Sicily. Jillian, Jen. Within. Mo, Molt Horse, Capon, Coxcomb, Idiot, Patch. Either get thee from the door or sit down in the hatch. Dost thou conjure for wenches that thou call'st for such store? When one is one too many, go get thee from the door. What patch has made our porter? My master stays in the street. Let him walk from whence he came, lest he catch cold on's feet. Who talks within there? Oh! Open the door! Right, sir. I'll tell you when, and you'll tell me wherefore. Wherefore? For my dinner! I have not dined today. Nor today here you must not. Come again when you may. What art thou that keepest me out from the house I owe? The porter for this time, sir, and my name is Dromio. O oh, villain! Thou hast stolen both mine office and my name. The one ne'er got me credit, the other mickle blame. If thou hast been Dromeo today in my place, thou wouldst have changed thy face for a name, or thy name for an ass. What coil is there, Dromeo? Who are those at the gates? Let my master in, Luce. Faith, no, he comes too late, so tell your master. O oh Lord, I must laugh. Have at you with a proverb. Shall I set in my staff? Have you with another that's when? Can you tell? If thy name be called Luce, Luce thou hast answered him well. Do you hear, you minion? You'll let us in, I hope. I thought to have asked you. And you said no. So come help. Well struck, there was blow for blow. Thou baggage, let me in. Can you tell for whose sake? Master, knock the door hard. Oh, let him knock till it ache. You'll cry for this minion if I beat the door down. 
What needs all that and a pair of stocks in the town? Who is that at the door that keeps all this noise? By my troth, your town is troubled with unruly boys. Are you there, wife? You might have come before. Your wife, sir knave, go get you from the door. If you went in pain, master, this knave would go sore. Here is neither cheer, sir, nor welcome. We would fain have either. In debating which was best, we shall part with neither. They stand at the door, master. Bid them welcome hither. There is something in the wind that we cannot get in. You would say so, master, if your garments were thin. Your cake here is warm within. You stand here in the cold. It would make a man mad as a buck to be so bought and sold. Go fetch me something. I'll break up the gate. Break any breaking here, and I'll break your knave's pate. A man may break a word with you, sir, and words are but wind. Ay, and break it in your face, so he break it not behind. It seems thou wantest breaking. Out upon thee, hind. Here's too much. Out upon thee. I pray thee, let me in. Ay, when fowls have no feathers and fish have no fin. Well, I'll break in. Go borrow me a crow. A crow without feather? Master, mean you so? For a fish without a fin, there's a fowl without a feather. If a crow help us in, sirrah, we'll pluck a crow together. Go get thee gone. Fetch me an iron crow. Have patience, sir. Oh, let it not be so. Herein you war against your reputation, and draw within the compass of suspect the unviolated honour of your wife. Once this, your long experience of her wisdom, her sober virtue, years and modesty, plead on her part some cause to you unknown, and doubt not, sir, but she will well excuse why at this time the doors are made against you. Be ruled by me. Depart in patience, and let us to the tiger all to dinner, and about evening come yourself alone to know the reason of this strange restraint. If, by strong hand, you offer to break in now in the stirring passage of the day, a vulgar comment will be made of it, and that supposed by the common rout against your yet ungalled estimation that may with foul intrusion enter in, and dwell upon your grave when you were dead. For slander lives upon succession, forever housed where it gets possession. You have prevailed. I will depart in quiet, and, in despite of mirth, mean to be merry. I know a wench of excellent discourse, pretty and witty, wild, and yet too gentle. There will we dine. This woman that I mean, my wife, but I protest without desert, hath oft times upbraided me with all. To her will we to dinner. To Angelo. Get you home and fetch the chain. By this I know tis made. Bring it, I pray you, to the porpentine. For there's the house that chain will I bestow, be it for nothing but to spite my wife, upon mine hostess there. Good sir, make haste. Since mine own doors refuse to entertain me, I'll knock elsewhere to see if they'll disdain me. I'll meet you at that place some hour hence. Do so. This jest shall cost me some expense. Exeunt. Scene two. The same. Enter Luciana and Antipholus of Syracuse. And may it be that you have quite forgot a husband's office. Shall Antipholus, even in the spring of love, thou love springs wrought, shall love, in building, grow so ruinous? If you did wed my sister for her wealth, then for her wealth's sake use her with more kindness. Or if you like elsewhere, do it by stealth, muffle your false love with some show of blindness. Let not my sister read it in your eye. Be not thy tongue thy own shame's orator. Look sweet, speak fair, become disloyalty. Apparel vice like virtue's harbinger, bear a fair presence, though your heart be tainted. Teach sin the carriage of a holy saint, be secret false, what need she be acquainted? What simple thief brags of his own attaint? Tis double wrong to truant with your bed, and let her read it in thy looks at board. Shame hath a bastard fame, well managed. Ill deeds are doubled with an evil word. Alas, poor women, make us but believe, being compact of credit, that you love us, though others have the arm, show us the sleeve. We in your motion turn, and you may move us. 
then gentle brother get you in again comfort my sister cheer her call her wife tis holy sport to be a little vain when the sweet breath of flattery conquers strife sweet mistress what your name is else i know not nor by what wonder you do hit of mine less in your knowledge and your grace you show not than our earth's wonder more than earth divine teach me dear creature how to think and speak lay open to my earthy gross conceit smothered in errors feeble shallow weak the folded meaning of your words deceit against my soul's pure truth why labor you to make it wander in an unknown field are you a god would you create me new transform me then and to your power i'll yield but if that i am i then well i know your weeping sister is no wife of mine nor to her bed no homage do i owe far more far more to you do i decline o oh, train me not sweet mermaid with thy note to drown me in thy sister flood of tears sing siren for thyself and i will dote spread o'er the silver waves thy golden hairs and as a bed i'll take them and there lie and in that glorious supposition think he gains by death that hath such means to die let love being light be drowned if she sink what are you mad that you do reason so not mad but mated how i do not know it is a fault that springeth from your eye for gazing on your beams fair son being by gaze where you should and that will clear your sight as good to wink sweet love as look on night why call you me love call my sister so thy sister's sister that's my sister no it is thyself mine own self's better part mine eyes clear eye my dear heart's dearer heart my food my fortune and my sweet hopes aim my soul earth's heaven and my heaven's claim all this my sister is or else should be call thyself sister sweet for i am thee thee will i love and with thee lead my life thou hast no husband yet nor i no wife give me thy hand o oh, soft sir hold you still i'll fetch my sister to get her good will exit enter dromio of syracuse why how now dromio where runnest thou so fast do you know me sir am i dromio am i your man am i myself thou art dromio thou art my man thou art thyself i am an ass i am a woman's man and besides myself what woman's man and how besides thyself marry sir besides myself i am due to a woman one that claims me one that haunts me one that will have me what claim lays she to thee marry sir such claim as you would lay to your horse and she would have me as a beast not that i being a beast she would have me but that she being a very beastly creature lays claim to me what is she a very reverend body i such as one as a man may not speak of without he say sir reverence i have but lean luck in the match and yet she's a wondrous fat marriage how dost thou mean a fat marriage marry sir she's the kitchen wench and all grease and I know not what use to put her to, but to make a lamp of her and run from her by her own light. I warrant her rags and the tallow in them will burn a pole in winter. If she lives till doomsday, she'll burn a week longer than the whole world. What complexion is she of? Swart, like my shoe, but her face nothing like so clean kept. For why she sweats, a man may go over shoes in the grime of it. That's a fault that water will mend. No, sir, tis in rain. Noah's flood could not do it. What's her name? Nell, sir. But her name in three quarters, that's an L in three quarters, will not measure her from hip to hip. Then she bears some breath? No longer from head to foot than from hip to hip. She is spherical like a globe. I could find out countries in her. In what part of her body stands Ireland? Marry, sir, in her buttocks. I found it out by the bogs. Where's Scotland? I found it by the barrenness, hard in the palm of the hand. Where France? In her forehead, armed and reverted, making war against her hair. Where England? I looked for the chalky cliffs, but I could find no whiteness in them, but I guess it stood in her chin by the salt reum that ran between France and it. 
Where's Spain? Faith, I saw it not, but I felt it hot in her breath. Where America, the Indies? Oh, sir, upon her nose, all o'er embellished with rubies, carbuncles, sapphires, declining their rich aspect to the hot breath of Spain, who sent whole armados of caracks to be ballast at her nose. Where stood Belgia, the Netherlands? Oh, sir, I did not look so low. To conclude, this drudge, or diviner, laid claim to me, called me Dromio, swore I was assured to her, told me what privy marks I had about me, asked the mark of my shoulder, the mole in my neck, the great wart on my left arm, that I amazed ran from her as a witch. And I think, if my breast had not been made of faith and my heart of steel, she had transformed me to a curdle dog and made me turn in the wheel. Go hie thee presently, post to the road, and if the wind blow any way from shore, I will not harbor in this town to-night. If any bark forth, come to the mart, where I will walk till thou return to me. If every one knows us, and we know none, tis time, I think, to trudge, pack, and be gone. As from a bear a man would run for life, so fly I from her that would be my wife. Exit. There's none but witches to inhabit here, and therefore tis high time that I were hence. She that doth call me husband, even my soul doth for a wife abhor, but her fair sister, possessed with such a gentle sovereign grace, of such enchanting presence and discourse, hath almost made me traitor to myself. But lest myself be guilty to self-wrong, I'll stop mine ears against the mermaid's song. Enter Angelo with a chain. Master Antiphilus. Aye, that's my name. I know it well, sir. Lo, here is the chain. I thought to have ta'en you out the porpentine. The chain unfinished made me stay thus long. What is your will that I shall do with this? What please yourself, sir? I have made it for you. Made it for me, sir? I bespoke it not. Not once, nor twice, but twenty times you have. Go home with it, and please your wife withal. And soon at supper-time I'll visit you, and then receive my money for the chain. I pray you, sir, receive the money now, for fear you ne'er see chain nor money more. You are a merry man, sir. Fare you well. Exit. What shall I think of this I cannot tell? But this I think, there's no man is so vain, that would refuse so fair an offered chain. I see a man here needs not live by shifts, when in the streets he meets such golden gifts. I'll to the mart, and therefore Dromeo stay. If any ship put out, then straight away. Exit. End of Act Three. Comedy of Errors by William Shakespeare, translated by William George Clarke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Four, Scene One, A Public Place. Enter Second Merchant Angelo and an officer. You know, since Pentecost the sum is due. And since I have not much importuned you, nor now I had not, but that I am bound to Persia, and want guilders for my voyage. Therefore make present satisfaction, or I'll attach you by this officer. Even just the sum that I do owe to you is growing to me by Antiphilus, and in the instant that I met with you he had of me a chain. At five o'clock I shall receive the money for the same. Pleaseth you walk with me down to his house, I will discharge my bond, and thank you too. Enter Antiphilus of Ephesus, and Dromio of Ephesus, from the courtesans. That labour may you save. See where he comes. While I go to the goldsmith's house, go thou and buy a rope's end, that I will bestow among my wife and her confederates for locking me out of my doors by day. But soft, I see the goldsmith. Get thee gone. Buy thou a rope and bring it home to me. I buy a thousand pound a year, I buy a rope. Exit. A man is well hopped up to trust to you. I promised your presence and the chain, but neither chain nor goldsmith came to me. Be like you thought our love would last too long if they were chained together, and therefore came not. 
saving your merry humour here's the note how much your chain weighs to the utmost carrot the fineness of the gold and chargeful fashion which doth amount to three odd ducats more than i stand debted to this gentleman i pray you see him presently discharged for he is bound to see and stays but for it i am not furnished with the present money besides i have some business in the town good signor take the stranger to my house and with you take the chain and bid my wife disperse the sum on the receipt thereof perchance i will be there as soon as you then you will bring the chain to her yourself no bear it with you lest i come not time enough well sir i will have you the chain about you and if i have not sir i hope you have or else you may return without your money nay come i pray you sir give me the chain both wind and tide stays for this gentleman and i to blame have held him here too long good lord you use this dalliance to excuse your breach of promise to the porpentine i should have chided you for not bringing it but like a shrew you first begin to brawl the hour steals on i pray you sir dispatch you hear how he importunes me the chain why give it to my wife and fetch your money come come you know i gave it you even now either send the chain or send me by some token fie now you run this humour out of breath come where's the chain i pray you let me see it my business cannot brook this dalliance good sir say whether you'll answer me or no if not, I'll leave him to the officer. I answer you? What should I answer you? The money that you owe me for the chain. I owe you none till I receive the chain. You know I gave it you half an hour since. You gave me none. You wrong me much to say so. You wrong me more, sir, in denying it. Consider how it stands upon my credit. Well, officer? Arrest him at my suit. I do, and charge you in the Duke's name to obey me. This touches me in reputation. Either consent to pay this sum for me, or I attach you by this officer. Consent to pay thee that I never had? Arrest me, foolish fellow, if thou darest. Here is thy fee. Arrest him, officer. I would not spare my brother in this case if he should scorn me so apparently. I do arrest you, sir. You hear the suit. I do obey thee till I give thee bail. But, sir, uh, you shall buy this sport as dear as all the metal in your shop will answer. Sir, sir, I shall have law in Ephesus, to your notorious shame. I doubt it not. Enter Dromio of Syracuse, from the bay. Master, there is a bark of Epidamnum that stays but till her owner comes aboard, and then, sir, she bears away. Our fraudage, sir, I have conveyed aboard, and I have bought the oil, the balsamum, and aqua vitae. The ship is in her trim, the merry wind blows fair from land. They stay for naught at all, but their owner, master, and yourself. How now? A madman! Why, thou peevish sheep, what ship of Epidamnum stays for me? A ship you sent me to, to hire waftage. Thou drunken slave! I sent thee for a rope, and told thee to what purpose and what end. You sent me for a rope's end as soon you sent me to the bay, sir, for a bark. I will debate this matter at more leisure, and teach your ears to list me with more heed. To an Adriana, villain, hide thee straight. Give her this key, and tell her in the desk that's covered o'er with Turkish tapestry, there is a purse of ducats. Let her send it. Tell her I am arrested in the street, and that shall bail me. Hi thee, slave, be gone! On, officer, to prison till it come. Exalt second merchant, Angelo, officer, and Antipholus of Ephesus. To Adriana, this is where we dined, where Dousabel did claim me for her husband, she is too big, I hope, for me to compass. Thither I must, although against my will, for servants must their masters' minds fulfil. Exit. Scene two. The house of Antipholus of Ephesus. Enter Adriana and Luciana. 
ah luciana did he tempt thee so mightest thou perceive austerely in his eye that he did plead in earnest yea or no looked he red or pale or sad or merrily what observation madest thou in this case of his heart's meteors tilting in his face first he denied you had in him no right he meant he did me none the more my spite then swore he that he was a stranger here and true he swore though yet forsworn he were then pleaded i for you and what said he that love i begged for you he begged of me with what persuasion did he tempt thy love with words that in an honest suit might move first he did praise my beauty then my speech didst speak him fair have patience i beseech i cannot nor i will not hold me still my tongue though not my heart shall have his will he is deformed crooked old and seer ill-faced worse-bodied shapeless everywhere vicious ungentle foolish blunt unkind stigmatical in making worse in mind who would be jealous then of such a one no evil lost is wailed when it is gone ah but i think him better than i say and yet would herein others eyes were worse far from her nest the lapwing cries away my heart prays for him though my tongue do curse enter dromio of syracuse here go the desk the purse sweet now make haste how hast thou lost thy breath by running fast where is thy master dromio is he well no he's in tartar limbo worse than hell a devil in an everlasting garment hath him one whose hard heart is buttoned up with steel a fiend a fury pitiless and rough a wolf nay worse a fellow all in buff a back friend a shoulder clapper one that countermands the passages of alleys creeks and narrow lands a hound that rounds counter and yet draws dry foot well one that before the judgment carries poor souls to hell why man what is the matter i do not know the matter he's rested on the case what is he arrested tell me at whose suit i know not at whose suit he is arrested well but he's in a suit of buff which rested him that can i tell will you send him mistress redemption the money in his desk go fetch it sister exit luciana this i wonder at that he unknown to me should be in debt tell me was he arrested on a band not on a band but on a stronger thing a chain a chain do you not hear it ring what the chain no no the bell tis time that i were gone it was two ere i left him and now the clock strikes one the hours come back that i did never hear oh yes if any hour meet a surgeon that turns back for very fear as if time were in debt how fondly dost thou reason time is a very bankrupt and knows more than he's worth to season nay he's a thief too have you not heard men say that time comes stealing on by night and day if time be in debt and theft and a surgeon in the way hath he not reason to turn back an hour in a day re-enter luciana with a purse go dromio there's the money bear it straight and bring thy master home immediately come sister i am pressed down with conceit conceit my comfort and my injury exeunt scene three a public place enter antipholus of syracuse there's not a man i meet but doth salute me as if i were their well acquainted friend and every one doth call me by my name some tender money to me some invite me some other give me thanks for kindnesses some offer me commodities to buy even now a tailor called me in his shop and showed me silks that he had bought for me and therewithal took measure of my body sure these are but imaginary wiles and lapland sorcerers inhabit here enter dromio of syracuse 
Master, here's the gold you sent me for. What, have you got the picture of old Adam new apparelled? What gold is this? What Adam dost thou mean? Not that Adam that kept the paradise, but that Adam that keeps the prison. He that goes in the calf skin that was killed for the prodigal. He that came behind you, sir, like an evil angel, and bid you forsake your liberty. I understand thee not. No? Why, tis a plain case. He that went like a base file in a case of leather. The man, sir, that when gentlemen are tired gives them a sob and rests them. He, sir, that takes pity on decayed men and gives them suits of durance. He that sets up his rest to do more exploits with his mace than a morris pike. What? Thou meanest an officer? Aye, sir, the sergeant of the band. He that brings any man to answer it that breaks his band, one that thinks a man always going to bed, and says, God give you good rest. Well, sir, there rest in your foolery. Is there any ship puts forth to-night? May we be gone? Why, sir, I brought you word an hour since that the bark expedition put forth to-night, and then were you hindered by the surgeon to tarry for the hoy delay, here are the angels that you sent for to deliver you. The fellow is distract, and so am I, and here we wander in illusions. Some blessed power deliver us from hence. Enter a courtesan. Well met, well met, Master Antipholus. I see, sir, you have found the goldsmith now. Is that the chain you promised me today? Satan, avoid! I charge thee, tempt me not! Master, is this mistress Satan? It is the devil. Nay, she is worse, she is the devil's dam, and here she comes in the habit of a light wench, and thereof comes that the wenches say, God damn me, and says much to say, God make me a light wench. It is written, they appear to men like angels of light, Light is an effect of fire, and fire will burn. Ergo, light wenches will burn. Come not near her. Your man and you are marvellous merry, sir. Will you go with me? We'll mend our dinner here. Master, if you do, expect spoon meat, or bespeak a long spoon. Why, Dromeo? Mary, he must have a long spoon that must eat with the devil. Avoid, then, fiend. What tellest thou me of supping? Thou art, as you all are, a sorceress. I conjure thee to leave me and be gone. Give me the ring of mine you had at dinner, or for my diamond the chain you promised, and I'll be gone, sir, and not trouble you. Some devils ask but the parings of one's nail, a rush, a hair, a drop of blood, a pin, a nut, a cherry stone, but she, more covetous, would have a chain. Master, be wise, and if you give it her, the devil will shake her chain and fright us with it. I pray you, sir, my ring, or else the chain. I hope you do not mean to cheat me so. Avaunt, thou witch. Come, Dromeo, let us go. Fly pride, says the peacock, mistress that you know. Exaunt Antipholus of Syracuse, and Dromeo of Syracuse. Now. Out of doubt, Antiphilus is mad, else would he never so demean himself. A ring he hath of mine worth forty ducats, and for the same he promised me a chain. Both one and other he denies me now. The reason that I gather he is mad, besides this present instance of his rage, is a mad tale he told today at dinner, of his own doors being shut against his entrance. Be like his wife acquainted with his fits, on purpose shut the doors against his way. My way is now to his home, to his house, and tell his wife that, being lunatic, he rushed into my house and took perforce my ring away. This course I fittest choose, for forty ducats is too much to lose. Exit Scene 4 A Street Enter Antipholus of Ephesus, and the officer. Fear me not, man, I will not break away. I'll give thee, ere I leave thee, so much money to warrant thee, as I am rested for. My wife is in a wayward mood today, and will not lightly trust the messenger. That I should be attached in Ephesus, I tell you, will sound harshly in her ears. Enter Dromeo of Ephesus, with a rope's end. Here comes my man. 
I think he brings the money. How now, sir? Have you that I sent you for? Here's that, I warrant you. We'll pay them all. But where's the money? Why, sir, I gave the money for the rope. Five hundred ducats, villain, for a rope? I'll serve you, sir, five hundred at the rate. To what end did I bid thee hie thee home? To a rope's end, sir, and to that end I am returned. And to that end, sir, I will welcome you. Beating him. Good sir, be patient. Nay, tis for me to be patient. I am in adversity. Good now, hold thy tongue. Nay, rather persuade him to hold his hands. Thou whore son, senseless villain. I would I were senseless, sir, that I might not feel your blows. Thou art sensible in nothing but blows, and so is an ass. I am an ass indeed. You may prove it by my long ears. I have served him from the hour of my nativity to this instant, and have nothing at his hands for my service but blows. When I am cold, he heats me with beating. When I am warm, he cools me with beating. I am waked with it when I sleep, raised with it when I sit, driven out of doors with it when I go from home, welcomed home with it when I return. Nay, I bear it on my shoulders as a beggar want her brat, and I think, when he hath lamed me, I shall beg with it from door to door. Come, go along. My wife is coming yonder. Enter Adriana, Luciana, the courtesan, and Pinch. Mistress, respice finem, respect your end, or rather, the prophecy like the parrot, beware the rope's end. Wilt thou still talk? Beating him. How say you now? Is not your husband mad? His incivility confirms no less. Good Dr. Pinch, you are a conjurer. Establish him in his true sense again, and I will please you what you will demand. Alas, how fiery and how sharp he looks! Mark how he trembles in his ecstasy. Give me your hand and let me feel your pulse. Here is my hand, and let it feel your ear. Striking him. I charge thee, Satan, housed within this man, to yield possession to my holy prayers, and to thy state of darkness, his thee straight. I conjure thee by all the saints in heaven. Peace, doting wizard, peace, I am not mad. Oh, that thou wert not poor distressed soul. You minion, you, are these your customers? Did this companion with the saffron face revel and feasted at my house to-day, whilst upon me the guilty doors were shut, and I denied to enter in my house? O oh, husband, God doth know you dined at home. Where would you had remained until this time, free from these slanders and this open shame? Dined at home? Thou villain, what sayest thou? Sir, sooth to say, you did not dine at home. Were not my doors locked up, and I shut out? Perdie, your doors were locked, and you shut out. And did not she herself revile me there? Sans fable, she herself reviled you there. Did not her kitchen-maid rail, taunt, and scorn me? Cert, she did. The kitchen vestal scorned you. And did not I in rage depart from thence? In verity you did, my bones bear witness, that sense have felt the vigor of his rage. Is it good to soothe him in these contraries? It is no shame the fellow finds his vein, and yielding to him humors well his frenzy. Thou hast suborned the goldsmith to arrest me. Alas, I sent you money to redeem you by Dromeo here, who came in haste for it. Money by me? Heart and good will you might, but surely, master, not a rag of money. Wenst thou thou to her for a purse of ducats? He came to me, and I delivered it. And I am witness with her that she did. God and the rope-maker bear me witness that I was sent for nothing but a rope. Mistress, both man and master is possessed. I know it by their pale and deadly looks. They must be bound and laid in some dark room. 
Say, wherefore didst them walk me forth today? And why dost thou deny the bag of gold? I did not, gentle husband, lock thee forth. And gentle master, I received no gold, but I confess, sir, that we were locked out. Dissembling villain, then speakest false in both. Dissembling harlot, thou art false in all, and art confederate with a damned pack to make a loathsome abject scorn of me. But with these nails I'll pluck out these false eyes that would behold in me this shameful sport. Enter three or four and offer to bind him. He strives. Oh, bind him, bind him, let him not come near me. More company, the find is strong within him. Ay me, poor man, how pale and wan he looks. What, will you murder me? Thou jailer, thou I am thy prisoner. Wilt thou suffer them to make a rescue? Masters, let him go. He is my prisoner, and you shall not have him. Go bind this man, for he is frantic too. They offer to bind Romeo of Ephesus. What wilt thou do, thou peevish officer? Hast thou delight to see a wretched man do outrage and displeasure to himself? He is my prisoner. If I let him go, the debt he owes will be required of me. I will discharge thee ere I go from thee. Bear me forwith unto his creditor, and knowing how the debt grows, I will pay it. Good master doctor, see him safe conveyed home to my house. O oh, most unhappy day! O oh, most unhappy strumpet! Master, I am here entered in bond for you. Out on thee, villain! Wherefore dost thou mad me? Will you be bound for nothing? Be mad, good master! Cry, the devil! God help poor souls! How idly do they talk! Go bear him hence. Sister, go you with me. Exhort all but Adriana, Luciana, officer, and courtesan. Say now, whose suit is he arrested at? One Angelo, a goldsmith. Do you know him? I know the man. What is the sum he owes? Two hundred ducats. Say, how grows it due? Due for a chain your husband had of him. He did bespeak a chain for me, but had it not. When is your husband, all in rage today, came to my house and took away my ring, the ring I saw upon his finger now, straight after did I meet him with the chain? It may be so, but I did never see it. Come, jailer, bring me where the goldsmith is. I long to know the truth hereof at large. Enter Antipholus of Syracuse with his rapier drawn, and Dromeo of Syracuse. God, for thy mercy! They are loose again. And come with naked swords. Let's call more help to have them bound again. Away! They'll kill us! Exhort all but Antipholus of Syracuse, and Dromeo of Syracuse. I see these witches are afraid of swords. She that would be your wife now ran from you. Come to the centaur, fetch our stuff from thence. I long that we were safe and sound aboard. Faith, stay here this night. They will surely do us no harm. You saw they speak us fair, give us gold. Methinks there is such a gentle nation, that but for the mountain of mad flesh that claims marriage of me, I could find in my heart to stay here still and turn witch. I will not stay tonight for all the town. Therefore away to get our stuff aboard. Exeunt. End of Act 4. The Comedy of Eris by William Shakespeare. Translated by William George Clark. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Five. Scene One. A street before a priory. Enter Second Merchant and Angelo. I am sorry, sir, that I have hindered you. 
but I protest he had the chain of me, though most dishonestly he doth deny it. How is the man esteemed here in the city? Of very reverent reputation, sir, of credit infinite, highly beloved, second to none that lives here in the city. His word might bear my wealth at any time. Speak softly. Yonder, as I think, he walks. Enter Antipholus of Syracuse, and Dromio of Syracuse. Tis so. And that self-chain about his neck, which he forswore most monstrously to have. Good sir, draw near to me. I'll speak to him. Signor Antipholus, I wonder much that you would put me to this shame and trouble, and not without some scandal to yourself, with circumstance and oaths so to deny this chain which now you wear so openly. Beside the charge, the shame, imprisonment, you have done wrong to this my honest friend, who but for staying on our controversy had hoisted sail and put to sea to-day. This chain you had of me. Can you deny it? I think I had. I never did deny it. Yes, that you did, sir, and forswore it, too. Who heard me to deny it or forswear it? These ears of mine thou knowest did hear thee. Fie on thee, wretch! Tis pity that thou livest to walk where any honest men resort. Thou art a villain to impeach me thus. I'll prove mine honour and mine honesty against thee presently, if thou darest stand. I dare, and do defy thee for a villain. They draw. Enter Adriana, Luciana, the courtesan, and others. Hold him, hurt him not, for God's sake, he is mad. Some get within him, take his sword away, bind Dromeo too, and bear them to my house. Run, master, run, for God's sake, take a house, this is some priory, in, or we are spoiled. Exaunt Antipholus of Syracuse, and Dromeo of Syracuse, to the priory. Enter the lady abbess. Be quiet, people. Wherefore throng you hither? To fetch my poor distracted husband hence. Let us come in, that we may bind him fast, and bear him home for his recovery. I knew he was not in his perfect wits. I am sorry now that I did draw on him. How long hath this possession held the man? This week he hath been heavy, sour, sad, and much different from the man he was. But till this afternoon his passion ne'er break into extremity of rage. Hath he not lost much wealth by wreck of sea, buried some dear friend? Hath not else his eyes strayed his affection and unlawful love, a sin prevailing much in youthful men who give their eyes the a sin prevailing much in youthful men who give their eyes the liberty of gazing? Which of these sorrows is he subject to? To none of these except it be the last namely, some love that drew him oft from home. You should for that have reprehended him. Why, so I did. Ay, but not rough enough. As roughly as my modesty would let me. Haply in private. And in assemblies, too. Ay, but not enough. It was the copy of our conference. In bed he slept not for my urging it, at board he fed not for my urging it, alone it was the subject of my theme, in company I often glanced it, still did I tell him it was vile and bad. And thereof came it that the man was mad, the venom clamours of a jealous woman, poisons more deadly than a mad dog's tooth. It seems his sleeps were hindered by thy railing, and thereof comes it his head is light. Thou sayest his meat was sauced with thy upbraidings, and quiet meals make ill digestions. Thereof the raging fire of fever bred, and what's a fever but a fit of madness? Thou sayest his sports were hindered by thy brawls. Sweet recreation barred, what doth ensue but moody and dull melancholy? Kinsman to grim and comfortless despair, and at her heels a huge infectious troop of pale distemperatures and foes to life in food, in sport, and life-preserving breast to be disturbed, would mad or man or beast. The consequence is then thy jealous fits have scared thy husband from the use of his wits. She never reprehended him but mildly, when he demeaned himself, rough, rude, and widely. Why bear you these rebukes, and answer not? She did betray me to my own reproof. Good people enter and lay hold on him. No, not a creature enters in my house. 
then let your servants bring my husband forth neither he took this place for sanctuary and it shall privilege him from your hands till i have brought him to his wits again or lose my labour in assaying it i will attend my husband be his nurse diet his sickness for it is my office and will have no attorney but myself and therefore let me have him home with me be patient for i will not let him stir till i have used the approved means i have with wholesome syrups drugs and holy prayers to make of him a formal man again it is a branch and parcel of mine oath a charitable duty of my order therefore depart and leave him here with me i will not tense and leave my husband here and ill it doth beseem your holiness to separate the husband and the wife be quiet and depart thou shalt not have him exit complain unto the duke of this indignity come go i will fall prostrate at his feet and never rise until my tears and prayers have won his grace to come in person hither and take perforce my husband from the abbess by this i think the dial points at five anon i'm sure the duke himself in person comes this way to the melancholy vale the place of death and sorry execution behind the ditches of the abbey here upon what cause to see a reverend syracusian merchant who put unluckily into this bay against the laws and statutes of this town beheaded publicly for his offence see where they come we will behold his death kneel to the duke before he pass the abbey enter duke attended aegean bareheaded with the headsman and other officers yet once again proclaim it publicly if any friend will pay the sum for him he shall not die so much we tender him justice most sacred duke against the abbess she is a virtuous and a reverend lady it cannot be said that she hath done thee wrong may it please your grace antipholus my husband whom i made lord of me and all i had at your important letters this ill day a most outrageous fit of madness took him that desperately he hurried through the street with him his bondmen all mad as he doing displeasure to the citizens by rushing in their houses bearing thence rings jewels anything his rage did like once i did get him bound and sent him home whilst to take order for the wrongs i went that here and there his fury had committed anon i wot not by what strong escape he broke from those who had the guard of him and with his mad attendant and himself each one with ireful passion with drawn swords met us again and madly bent on us chased us away till raising of more aid we came again to bind them then they fled into this abbey whither we pursued them and here the abbess shuts the gates on us and will not suffer us to fetch him out nor send him forth that we may bear him hence therefore most gracious duke with thy command let him be brought forth and borne hence for thy help long since thy husband served me in my wars and i to thee engaged a prince's word when thou didst make him a master of thy bed to do him all the grace and good i could go some of you knock at the abbey gate and bid the lady abbess come to me i will determine this before i stir enter a servant O oh, mistress, mistress, shift him, save yourself. My master and his man are both broke loose, beaten the maids a row, and bound the doctor, whose beard they have singed off with brands of fire, and ever as it blazed, they threw on him great pails of puddled mire to quench the hair. My master preaches patience to him, and the while his man with scissors nicks him like a fool, and sure, unless you send some present help, between them they will kill the conjurer. Peace, fool! Thy master and his man are here, and that is false thou dost report to us. Mistress, upon my life I tell you true. I have not breathed almost since I did see it. He cries for you, and vows, if he can take you, to scorch your face and to disfigure you. Cry within. Hark, hark! I hear him, mistress. Fly, be gone! Come, stand by me. Fear nothing. Guard with the halberds. Ay, me, it is my husband, witness you, that he is borne about invisible. Even now we housed him in the abbey here, and now he's there, past thought of human reason. Enter Antipholus of Ephesus and Romeo of Ephesus. 
justice most gracious duke oh grant me justice even for the service that long since i did thee when i bestride thee in the wars and took deep scars to save thy life even for the blood that then i lost for thee now grant me justice unless the fear of death doth make me doubt i see my son antiphilus and dromio justice sweet prince against that woman there she whom thou gavest to me to be my wife that hath abused and dishonoured me even in the strength and height of injury beyond imagination is the wrong that she this day hath shameless thrown on me discover how and thou shalt find me just this day great duke she shut the doors upon me while she with harlots feasted in my house a grievous fault say woman didst thou so no my good lord myself he and my sister to-day did dine together so before my soul as this is false he burdens me withal ne'er may i look on day nor sleep on night but she tells to your highness simple truth o oh, perjured woman they are both forsworn in this the madman justly chargeth them my liege i am advised what i say neither disturbed with the effect of wine nor had he rash provoked with rising ire albeit my wrongs might make one wiser mad this woman locked me out this day from dinner that goldsmith there were he not packed with her could witness it for he was with me then who parted with me to go fetch a chain promising to bring it to the porpentine where balthazar and i did dine together our dinner done and he not coming thither i went to seek him in the street i met him and in his company that gentleman there did this perjured goldsmith swear me down that i this day of him received the chain which god he knows i saw not for the which he did arrest me with an officer i did obey and sent my peasant home for certain ducats he with none returned then fairly i bespoke the officer to go in person with me to my house by the way we met my wife her sister and a rabble more of vile confederates along with them they brought one pinch a hungry lean-faced villain a mere anatomy a mountebank a threadbare juggler and a fortune teller a needy hollow-eyed sharp-looking wretch a living dead man this pernicious slave forsooth took on him as a conjurer and gazing in my eyes feeling my pulse and with no face as twere out facing me cries out i was possessed then altogether they fell upon me bound me wore me thence and in a dark and dankish vault at home they are left me and my man both bound together till gnawing with my teeth my bonds in sunder i gained my freedom and immediately ran hither to your grace whom i beseech to give me ample satisfaction for these deep shames and great indignities my lord in truth thus far i witness with him that he dined not at home but was locked out but had he such a chain of thee or no he had my lord and when he ran in here these people saw the chain about his neck besides i will be sworn these ears of mine heard you confess you had the chain of him after you first forswore it on the mart and thereupon i drew my sword on you and then you fled into this abbey here from whence i think you are come by miracle i never came within these abbey walls nor ever didst thou draw thy sword on me i never saw the chain so help me heaven and this is false you burden me with all why what an intricate impeach this is i think you have drunk of circe's cup if here you housed him here he would have been if he were mad he would not plead so coldly you say he dined at home the goldsmith here denies that saying sirrah what say you sir he dined with her there at the porpentine he did and from my finger snatched that ring tis true my liege this ring i had of her sawest thou him enter at the abbey here as sure my liege as i do see your grace why this is strange go call the abbess hither i think you are all mated or stark mad 
Exit one to the abbess. Most mighty duke, vouchsafe me speak a word. Haply I see a friend will save my life and pay the sum that may deliver me. Speak freely, Syracusian, with what thou wilt. Is not your name, sir, called De Antiphilus? And is not that your bondman, Dromio? Within this hour I was his bondman, sir, but he, I thank him, gnawed into my cords. Now am I Dromio, and his man unbound. I am sure you both of you remember me. Ourselves we do remember, sir, by you, for lately we were bound as you are now. You are not Pinch's patient, are you, sir? Why look you strange on me? You know me well. I never saw you in my life till now. Ah, oh, grief hath changed me since you saw me last, and careful hours with time's deformed hand have written strange defeatures in my face. But tell me yet, dost thou not know my voice? Neither. Dromeo, nor thou? No, trust me, sir, nor I. I'm sure thou dost. I, sir, but I am sure I do not, and whatsoever a man denies, you are now bound to believe him. Not know my voice. Oh, time's extremity, hast thou so cracked and splitted my poor tongue in seven short years, that here my only son knows not my feeble key of untuned cares? Though now this grained face of mine be hid in sap consuming winter's drizzled snow, and all the conduits of my blood froze up, yet hath my night of life some memory, my wasting lamps some fading glimmer left, my dull deaf ears a little used to hear. All these old witnesses, I cannot err, tell me thou art my son, Antiphilus. I never saw my father in my life. But seven years since, in Syracuse, boy, thou knowest we parted. But perhaps, my son, thou shamest to acknowledge me in misery. The Duke and all that know me in the city can witness with me that it is not so. I never saw Syracuse in my life. I tell thee, Syracusian, twenty years have I been patron to Antipholus during which time he ne'er saw Syracuse. I see thy age and dangers make thee dote. Re-enter Abbas with Antipholus of Syracuse and Romeo of Syracuse. Most mighty duke, behold a man much wronged. All gather to see them. I see two husbands, or mine eyes deceive me. One of these men is genius to the other, and so of these. Which is the natural man, and which the spirit? Who deciphers them? I, sir, am Dromeo. Command him away. I, sir, am Dromeo. Pray, let me stay. Aegean art thou not, or else his ghost? O oh, my old master, who hath bound him here? Whoever bound him, I will loose his bonds, and gain a husband by his liberty. Speak, old Aegean. If thou beest the man that hadst a wife once called Amelia, that bore thee at a burden two fair sons, oh, if thou beest the same Aegean, speak, and speak unto the same Amelia. If I dream not, thou art Amelia. If thou art she, tell me, where is that son that floated with thee on the fatal raft? By men of Epidanum he and I, and the twin Dromeo, all were taken up, and by and by the rude fishermen of Corinth by force took Dromeo and my son from them, and me they left with those of Epidanum. What then became of them I cannot tell, I to this fortune that you see me in. Why, here begins his morning story right. These two Antipholuses, these two so like, and these two Dromeos, one in semblance, Besides her urging of her wreck at sea, these are the parents to these children, who accidentally are met together. Antipholus, thou camest from Corinth first? No, sir, not I. I came from Syracuse. Stay, stand apart. I know not which is which. 
I came from Corinth, my most gracious lord. And I with him. Brought to this town by that most famous warrior, Duke Menaphon, your most renowned uncle. Which of you two did dine with me today? I, gentle mistress. And are you not my husband? No, I say nay to that. And so do I, yet did she call me so, and this fair gentlewoman, her sister here, did call me brother. To Lucia. What I told you then, I hope I shall have leisure to make good, if this be not a dream I see and hear. That is the chain, sir, which you had of me. I think it be, sir. I deny it not. And you, sir, for this chain arrested me. I think I did, sir. I deny it not. I sent you money, sir, to be your bail by Dromio, but I think he brought it not. No, none by me. This purse of ducats I received from you, and Dromio my man did bring them me. I see we did still meet each other's man, and I was ta'en for him, and he for me, and thereupon these errors are arose. These ducats pawn I for my father here. It shall not need, thy father hath his life. Sir, I must have that diamond from you. There, take it, and much thanks for my good cheer. Renowned Duke, vouchsafe to take the pains to go with us into the abbey here, and here at large discoursed all our fortunes, and all that are assembled in this place, that by this sympathized one day's error have suffered wrong, go, keep us company, and we shall make full satisfaction. Thirty-three years I have but gone in travail of you, my sons, and till this present hour my heavy burthen ne'er delivered. The Duke, my husband, and my children both, and you, the calendars of their nativity, go to a gossip's feast, and go with me, after so long grief, such nativity. With all my heart I'll gossip at this feast. Exhort all but Antipholus of Syracuse, Antipholus of Ephesus, Dromio of Syracuse, and Dromio of Ephesus. Master, shall I fetch your stuff from shipboard? Dromio, what stuff of mine hast thou unmarked? Your goods that lay at host, sir, in the centaur. He speaks to me. I'm your master, Dromio. Come, go with us. We'll look to that anon. Embrace thy brother here, rejoice with him. Exalt Antipholus of Syracuse, and Antipholus of Ephesus. There is a fat friend at your master's house that kitchened me for you today at dinner. She now shall be my sister, not my wife. Methinks you are my glass, and not my brother. I see by you I am a sweet-faced youth. Will you walk in to see their gossiping? Not I, sir. You are my elder. That's a question. How shall we try it? We'll draw cuts for the senior. Till then, lead thou first. Nay, then, thus. We came into the world like brother and brother, and now let's go hand in hand, not one before another. Excellent. End of Act 5 End of The Comedy of Eris by William Shakespeare Translated by William George Clark